Hey there guys, alright, today we are back with some more Overly Sarcastic Productions. This time we're going to watch their new episode, Miscellaneous Myths, Aphrodite's Affair. When Aphrodite cheated on Hephaestus so that she could boink Ares. Yeah, a great, a great story. Um, at least I'm assuming that's what this is going to cover. I'm actually surprised that, because it's... June. I was actually expecting um, one of their newer episodes to be more related to Pride Tales, uh, like Pride Tales that we had just watched uh, just a few days ago. But we'll see. Maybe maybe she'll twist it around, and this will still also be a story for Pride Month. I'm not sure. Before we dive in, though, make sure you go and check out the links in the description box below. I would love it if you joined the Discord and followed me over at Twitch. Ha! <sighs> Now that all that's out of the way, let's go ahead and just dive right into the video. In the giant spaghettified mess that is the pantheon of Olympian gods, there are a number of relationships that could be charitably described as unhealthy. It is a col- 100, uh, I would say 90% of them are probably unhealthy. I would even, you could even bump that number up. Colossal mess of affairs and love children and plenty of revenge that benefits precisely nobody except Aphrodite, goddess of passion and love who enjoys nothing more than relationship drama and when she can't find it, she will create it. Yes. Though she can't take credit for yes. all the drama, she certainly seems to have a hand in the majority of it, encouraging love affairs and directing Eros to break a few hearts when it's a slow week or she's bored or it's a day ending in Y. But while wrecking hmm. other people's lives is good clean fun, Aphrodite's own love life is a rather complicated and fraught affair, pun intended early attestations remain to be fixed to them these he was now fixing and he was hammering at the rivets while he was thus at work silver-footed thetis came to the house Paris of graceful headdress wife to the far-famed lame god came towards her as soon as she saw her and took her hand in her own saying why have you come to our house thetis honored and ever welcome for you do not visit us often Come inside and let me set refreshment for you. ...from Homer and the Iliad describe her as happily unmarried and a consort to Ares, god of war, Natch. But then Homer's Odyssey cites her as married to Hephaestus, god of the forge and brother to Ares, while still consorting with Ares on the side. This is a bit jarring for several reasons. Aphrodite is the universally desired goddess of lust and attraction, while Hephaestus is, shall we say, not the most polished hammer in the forge. He's a very skilled artisan, respected for his craft, but he's also often characterized as cunning, rude, and alienated from the rest of the Olympians, especially his mother Hera, who in several tellings chucked him off Olympus shortly after his birth because he had a congenital impairment and she was kind of a jerk like that. This isn't yeah. actually consistent though. In other versions, including the one in the Iliad, it was Zeus who drop kicked him off Olympus because he was trying to protect Hera from Zeus, and injuries from the fall are what led to him becoming disabled rather than it being something he was born with. This lack of singular canon is very common in Greek mythology, so instead of it do be. It do be very common. Looking yeah. for a single true narrative because there is no point, we kind of have to look at the general vibes. And in general, <laughs> the vibe is not. We're vibe checking the Greek mythology. Let's fucking go. Great. Hephaestus is broadly respected for his work and very little else, while Aphrodite is loved for her beauty, while generally feared and disliked for how much trouble she causes. Pairing them up is inobvious, to put it mildly, and Homer doesn't really explain how it happened. Later stories eventually came up with explanations for how the odd couple came to be and how a goddess who could have any husband she wanted ended up with the guy it kind of felt like nobody would ever pick. One popular explanation- ah! It's a quick fix, but it'll cost you. The was that Hephaestus trapped his mother Hera with a trick throne and then demanded Aphrodite's hand in marriage in exchange for setting her free. In other anecdotes- If you can't play nice, I'm going- I'm giving her to the ugly one. <gasps> Gasp! Love you too, Dad. Zeus was apparently tired of everyone fighting over Aphrodite and married her off to Hephaestus to make the yelling stop. You may note that while these stories explain how the marriage happened, they don't really explore their relationship or how they feel about each other. The general consensus is they're not very functional, but we rarely get a look into how dysfunctional they actually are. One story that gives us a rare glimpse at the mess is recounted in Homer's Odyssey. So let's talk about it. Now our story begins very efficiently by laying out the status quo. Aphrodite and Hephaestus are married, but Aphrodite is carrying on a pretty steamy side romance with Ares, who's been wooing her with presents and flowers and squishy stuff like that. This is all kept very hush-hush and down low, but doesn't escape the attention of Helios, who has a pretty good view of everything on account of being the sun. So hmm. he decides to let Hephaestus- In hindsight, not the most surprising behavior for the goddess- 
Okay, I get it. Festus know what's been going on in his bedroom while he's off in his kick-ass volcano lair making robots and stuff. Hephaestus is, unsurprisingly, very displeased Ooh. to hear this and responds in the same way he solves most of his problems, by inventing something. Specifically, he fires up the forge and hammers out a huge lattice of incredibly fine chains, nearly invisible but totally unbreakable. Then Ooh. he scoots back home and drapes them all over the bedroom, creating an invisible net of unbreakable chains. Then he loudly announces that Okay, darling, I'm super definitely leaving now. He's going on a business trip to Lemnos and won't be back for a hot minute and scoots around the corner to wait. Ares naturally pops out. Yeehaw! Out of the bushes and scoots inside so he and Aphrodite can finish their Monopoly game, but they very quickly find the fun time scuttled by the golden net, which tangles them up and leaves them completely trapped. Hephaestus pops out of the woodwork and summons all the other Olympians to come see what he's caught. Poseidon, Hermes. I think Hephaestus wants us to look at Ares' butt. If I wanted Ares humiliated, I'd ask him to sell Diomedes. So this is that marital bliss I'm apparently missing. He's an Apollo pop down to see what all the fuss is about, but the rest of the gods catch one glimpse of exposed god booty and decide they've probably seen enough for one night. So Hephaestus is un- Well, uh, this is unsurprising, I know. No touchy. And surprisingly, pretty pissed about the whole situation. He knows he's not exactly a prize in the looks department, while his brother Ares is a chiseled specimen of masculine vigor, but just because he gets it doesn't mean this isn't a pretty spectacular violation of the marriage agreement, and he's not about that. So his plan is to keep them in the net until Zeus agrees to refund the dowry he paid when he married Aphrodite. The fact that this implies that he bought his wife and is now requesting a refund is just a smidge fucked, but it's not like the rest yeah. of the situation is any less fucked, so eh. Now Apollo and her- Really, is it fair to mock him when we'd have done the same, exact same thing? I'd have done it even if I knew about the trap. You boys need to stop flattering yourselves. Look, I get it, but this isn't sustainable. Hermes think this situation is absolutely hilarious, but Poseidon is taking the whole thing a bit more seriously and asks Hephaestus to let them go. Poseidon tells Hephaestus, Zeus owes me my bride price back. Zeus wouldn't pay for a bucket if Ares was on fire. He'll get Ares to pay the damages instead of Zeus, since it's more Ares' fault, but Hephaestus is reluctant, because what if Ares doesn't pay? So Poseidon just promises that if Ares goes back on the deal, he'll just cover the price out of pocket. Hephaestus, satisfied that he's getting his refund Fine. either way, releases the lovers. It's unclear if any lessons were learned that day, but the world certainly never forgot Hephaestus' great innovation of using chains in the bedroom. God damn it, Red. <laughs> God damn it. The funny thing is, one interpretation of this myth is that it ends with Hephaestus and Aphrodite fully splitting up. If later Jeez. writers had leaned into that, they wouldn't have had to do so much work explaining the marriage. In I also wish there were more stories where these two are a functional odd couple. It'd be cute. Got me. And that was Miscellaneous Myths, Aphrodite's Affair. Uh, yeah, this was, just, this was a good one. It was nice, short, sweet. Um, got really nothing to add, add on aside from that. Nice short and sweet. I like what um, uh, Rick Riordan does, uh, essentially, where it's this running gag between Hephaestus, Aphrodite, and Ares, where he's always trying to capture or c catch uh, Aphrodite and Ares. He doesn't seem to care all too much. Um, so it's still very much a dysfunctional relationship, but also because of. Um, uh, Hephaestus having demigod children of his own essentially means he doesn't care for the relationship with Aphrodite and that he's cheating on her as well. Um, you know, they both acknowledge, they both cheat. I don't know. Greek gods are weird, but that was Miscellaneous Myths Aphrodite's Affair. I hope you guys enjoyed. Remember to hit that like button and subscribe for more, and I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.